I am David Feldman, and this is the mop up breaking news only hours into his candidacy. Ron DeSantis is still running for president. <laughs> After that debacle on Twitter, Ron DeSantis, as of now, is still a candidate. Does anybody remember Florida Governor Jeb Bush? You don't, because in 2016, Donald Trump destroyed not just Florida Governor Jeb Bush. Donald Trump destroyed the entire Bush family. Jeb Bush ran against Donald Trump in 2016. He was presenting as a moderate Republican. There's no such thing. A kinder and gentler Republican to, to the boorish Donald Trump. And Donald Trump destroyed Florida Governor Jeb Bush. I don't like Donald Trump, but one of, you know, occasionally bullies do beat up the right person. And Donald Trump destroyed the Bush family. They're done. Thanks to Donald Trump for speaking the truth about Iraq and what the Bush family did to this country. I do not like Donald Trump, but I am so looking forward to the August debates when Donald Trump mops the floor with Ron Debacle. It's Ron Debacle. I was going to call him the Marquis DeSantis because he's such a sadist. After tonight's debacle on Twitter, we have to start calling him Ron Debacle. I'll have more about Ron Debacle coming up. As Speaker Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden seem to be at an impasse on how to keep the government running past June 1st, debate over lifting the debt ceiling continued on the House floor Wednesday. Kevin McCarthy, he's our Speaker, he insists that the Republican-controlled House passed a bill last month that solves the whole budget, the whole budget, the whole debt ceiling problem. He passed a bill, and he's telling the truth. They did pass a bill last month that would lift the debt ceiling by $1.5 trillion through March of next year. That is true. They did pass the bill in the House. The Republican-controlled House passed the Limit Save Grow Act. That's the name of the bill, the Limit Save Grow Act. And it was promoted by Speaker McCarthy. The Limit Grow Save Act would, as I said, raise the debt ceiling by $1.5 trillion, but would, among other things, claw back Joe Biden's student debt cancellation executive order. It would also add work requirements for Medicaid and food stamps. And very importantly, it would slash the $80 billion earmarked for IRS enforcement. This was earmarked in the Inflation Reduction Act. OK, this is very important. Hiring more IRS agents. It's severely understaffed the Internal Revenue Service. They can't collect taxes from rich people. The Biden administration, through the Inflation Reduction Act last year, injected 80 much needed billion dollars into the IRS. That is how you lower the debt by collecting taxes. Now, there's no discussion from either side about reversing the Trump tax cuts. And those Trump tax cuts tack on an additional $3.5 trillion to our national debt over the next 10 years. You want to solve the debt crisis? You don't need to suspend the, the debt ceiling, reverse the Trump tax cuts, which Joe Biden, as a candidate, promised to do. So I'm not here to blame the Democrats tonight. I'm here to blame the Republicans. The Republicans do not want to get rid of the Trump tax cuts. They are fine getting rid of taxes for the rich and powerful. And they are also hell-bent on defunding the Internal Revenue Service. And as I said, 
the Internal Revenue Service can't do its job unless it gets 70 much needed billion dollars. We're leaving billions of dollars uncollected each year. You spend $70 billion on the IRS. I think it brings in, I don't know what the exact number is, but you, if you spend $70 billion on the IRS, I think you get $7 trillion back over 10 years. It's money well spent. It's how you balance budgets. So Republicans don't care about balancing the budget. They just care about looting our government. The Republicans not only want to cut taxes for the rich, they, they want to make it easier for rich people to avoid paying taxes altogether, right? No money for the IRS. There's no, t there's no time or resources to go after rich people. Poor people are audited, not rich people. The earned income tax credit is the number one trigger for audits. But if you're a millionaire, a multimillionaire, the IRS is terrified of you because you can afford lawyers and the IRS is outgunned. So they leave rich people alone. Hence, we have a 30 some odd trillion dollar debt. OK, Kevin McCarthy last month passes the Limit Save Grow Act. As I said, he was willing to raise the debt limit by $1.5 trillion. As I said, it was passed last month in the House because Kevin McCarthy was able to convince his Republican caucus it was just cosmetic. He said, vote for this. It would never pass. It's never going to become law because a democratically controlled Senate will destroy this. But if we vote for it, it will provide political cover to the GOP and make it look like we are serious about tackling debt, which the Republicans are not. Here is Congresswoman Ilan Omar of Minnesota earlier on Wednesday explaining what the Limit Save Grow Act that Kevin McCarthy keeps bragging about. Here is uh, Congresswoman Elon Omar of Minnesota. The only reason they were able to pass the bill here is Kevin McCarthy was very clear to his caucus or conference by saying, don't worry about the substance. We just want to say we did something and we want to hold it over their heads. Don't worry about the substance. This is what Kevin McCarthy told his Republican conference, pass the bill. Don't worry about what's in it. It just makes us look good. More from Congresswoman Elon Omar. Many Republicans, if this was a real bill, would not have voted for it. Many of them know the, the kind of damage that their constituents will face in their pocketbooks every single day. Republicans are not the adults in the room. They create deficits. They create debt. More than like one third of our debt is because of Trump. Most of it came from Reagan and George W. Bush. Deficits don't matter. Dick Cheney said that in the lead up to the war in Iraq. More from Elon Omar about the Limit Save Grow Act, which Kevin McCarthy will be crowing about uh, as we move into default. So many Republicans would not be able to go back to their districts if this bill that they passed out of the House became law. Continue. They are not negotiating. They are looking to waste time, play games and make sure we default because they think that somehow that is going to be a political advantage that they will have in the coming elections. The reality is Americans are not going to forget and forgive them if there is a default. Congressman Ilan Omar, Wednesday, she's absolutely right. The Republicans are playing games. They want to make it look like they're responsible, that they care about deficits and debt. They only care about looting our treasury.
passing tax breaks to the rich and giving government contracts to the rich. That's all they care about. The Limit, Save, Grow Act that the Republican-controlled House passed last month is bull, you know what. It would force, and, and as Congresswoman Ilan Omar just said, there's no way Republicans could allow this to become law. It would force low-income moms and dads to work in order to receive food stamps and Medicaid for themselves and their families. As I've pointed out on the show already, low-income moms and dads who receive food stamps and Medicaid are already working. The working poor must collect food stamps and use Medicaid because the minimum wage is $7 and change. It hasn't been raised since Ted Kennedy was alive. I don't have it in front of me. I think the last time the minimum wage was bumped up was 2009. So working families are already working for their Medicaid and food stamps, right? You apply for a job at Walmart. The first thing they do is hand you an application for food stamps. So this idea that we're going to lower the budget deficit, get rid of the debt by making people who receive food stamps and Medicaid work for it. It's not, it's just cruel. It's just sadistic. There's a study coming out. Iowa is now making people work for food stamps. It costs more to administer the work for food stamps program than the food stamps themselves. I think it's like four times more expensive to monitor recipients of food stamps in Iowa to make sure that they're working than it is to just give them food stamps, to do the right thing. This is a party of fascists who, who thrive off cruelty and sadism. This isn't, I'm, I'm not casting aspersions against the Republican Party. There, this is a policy of sadism. This is why people vote for Republicans now, to be cruel. OK, so the Limit, Save, Grow Act, which Kevin McCarthy keeps bringing up. I mean, I'm so reasonable. I we passed it in the House. We're we're trying to solve this debt ceiling problem. It would have forced uh, recipients of food stamps and Medicaid uh, to to work. It would further cut entitlements overall. It was never a real bill. As Elon Omar just said, it was passed in the House to satisfy the Republican base's bloodlust. That is it. This is Kevin McCarthy's game. This is his game. So what do Republicans want? What, what do they want to see happen on June 1st? What, what do they want to see happen? Well, according to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, we run out of cash on June 1st. And as Congresswoman Elon Omar just said, they want Republicans. This is hard to believe, right? They want us to default. They want the government to default. It's an insurrection through other means. They want the government to default. Donald Trump said that at the town hall on CNN. Why? Because it would embarrass, they think it would embarrass Joe Biden. There are some Republicans who think that the, that if the federal government defaults, it doesn't pay back the money it borrowed, if it doesn't send out benefits to veterans, if the government literally shuts down most of the agencies in Washington, D.C., there are some Republicans, way too many Republicans, who believe that they can have it both ways. They can force the government to default. And they are banking on the stupidity of their own voters. They are banking on their ability to convince their stupid voters that the government defaulted on Joe Biden's watch. Therefore, it's Joe Biden's fault that the government defaulted. 
As I said last night, these Republicans hate the administrative state. They hate all the agencies. They want to eliminate the Department of Energy, the EPA, NHTSA. They want to, they want to eliminate every government agency. And it, if it means destroying our credit rating while doing it, hey, collateral damage. Literally damage to our collateral. One of the uh, provisos, provisos, one of the uh, ideas inside Kevin McCarthy's Limit, Save, Grow Act, remember that passed last month in the House, and it promises to lift 1.5, lift the debt ceiling by $1.5 trillion. I repeat things because this stuff is, you know, we're all economically illiterate. And, and they bank on our not knowing how this stuff works. So one of the provisos in Kevin McCarthy, McCarthy's counterfeit Limit Save Grow Act, and this is really important, one of, the, one of the measures inside that bill is to reverse Joe Biden's executive order that, that forgives $20,000 in federal student loans for every American who earns less than $125,000 a year. Now, I don't know if you remember this. There's a lot to keep track of, but through executive order, Joe Biden signed a, a student loan forgiveness of $20,000. If you have a, if you owe $20,000 to the federal government on your student loans and you earn less than $125,000 a year, you're forgiven. It's a drop in the ocean. But it's a start. Americans owe, listen to this, $1,800,000,000 in student loan debt to private lenders and the federal government. That's up there with credit card debt, car loans, mortgages. One of the leading drags on our economy is consumer debt. You have to relieve consumer debt to jumpstart the economy. Our, 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 our graduates, the people who went to college, owe $1,800,000,000. This should be forgiven. Close to 40 million Americans took out these loans to go to college after being told nobody would hire them unless they earned a degree. They earned the degree, but they're not earning enough to pay off these loans. They were sold a lie. And there are a lot of bullshit jobs out there that demand a degree. Joe Biden is beginning to address this. There are a lot of jobs where they just, we won't hire unless you have a college degree. So of course, 40 million Americans are gonna take out loans to go to college because how else do you survive? They hold a gun to our heads and say, borrow money to go to college, otherwise you're a failure. Other countries don't do this. In other countries, colleges are free, as is healthcare. Rational, sophisticated, civilized, what do we call it? We still call them first world countries. They realize that a free education is among other things, a great investment. It's a great investment for your country, and it grows your GDP. It grows your economy. That's a fact. Instead of putting Americans into debt, if you give them a, a free education, you would lift approximately 4.5 million Americans out of poverty today. There are about 4.5 4 million Americans who are living in poverty because they can't get out from underneath their student loan debt. Forgiving student loan debt would boost consumer spending, they say by almost 4%. It would increase our GDP, and it would make it easier for Americans to start their lives, to start a family, buy a home. 70% of Americans who owe, still haven't paid off their student loan debt, claim, 70% claim they have put their lives on hold. 
They can't figure out a way to start their lives until they pay back their student loans. So Joe Biden, it, it isn't enough, you know, with the stroke of a pen, he could forgive the entire debt. But uh, it's a drop in the bucket. But last year when Joe Biden introduced his plan, his executive order to forgive $20,000 in federal debt for Americans earning less than $125,000 a year, 16 million of us applied last fall for relief. 16 million Americans applied to have $20,000 in federal student loan debt forgiven. And Republicans were appalled. And they insisted debt relief would be what? Inflationary. So they are now challenging Biden's executive order in the Supreme Court. They have two cases going before the Supreme Court on Joe Biden's executive order for giving $20,000 in student loans. Here is Michigan Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib today, Wednesday, challenging Republicans for taking Biden's student debt relief executive order all the way to the Supreme Court. Here is Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. This is all happening, Mr. Speaker, while the far-right Republicans have filed a sham lawsuit to take it, take it before an unhinged, corrupt Supreme Court that has secretly accepted lavish trips and payments from billionaire Republican mega donors while considering striking down the student debt relief. That is Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Here is California Democratic Congresswoman Sidney Kamlager Dove. Here she is on Wednesday pointing out Republican hypocrisy when it comes to not wanting to forgive student loans. The hypocrisy of the Republicans. You, you can't forgive student loans. That's inflationary. But Republicans are perfectly fine taking PPP loans. Remember the Paycheck Protection Program loans during COVID? Republicans had no problem taking those loans. Here is Democratic Congresswoman Sidney Kamlager Dove. And if you want some real truth, let's not get it twisted. PPP was not a grant, and yet some of my Republican colleagues literally received millions in PPP loans, and I don't see anyone rushing to pay those back. Talk about unfair. The American people are paying those bills that they didn't incur. Nope. Republicans don't want to forgive anyone or anything except themselves. You know, I wish I, I really like her and what she's saying is spot on. But don't speak in shorthand. Americans have trouble following all this. They don't know what the PPP is. They have an idea of what PPP is. Some of them think it's Paycheck Protection Program. Others think PPPP is what Joe Biden is thinking during his press conferences. But just he's just thinking PPPP. Got to get this over. I got a PPPPPPP. Okay. One of, the one of the recipients of a 150000 PPP loan, Paycheck Protection Program loan, was the wonderful Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, she thinks forgiving student loan debt would be inflationary. She thinks it's unfair. Well, before the Republican challenge to Joe Biden's debt forgiveness before it goes before the Supreme Court, Kevin McCarthy introduced his bill, which would overturn Joe Biden's executive order and make the Supreme Court hearing irrelevant. The bill would block Biden's debt forgiveness. Now, to prove that Republicans are serious about uh, not forgiving student loan debt, in addition to the bill that McCarthy passed in the House last month on the debt ceiling, he reintroduced a bill on Wednesday to overrule Joe Biden's executive order for giving $20,000 in student loan debt for Americans earning less than $125,000 a year. This is how serious Kevin McCarthy is about not forgiving student loan debt. And to, to show how principled he is, 
he handed his gavel to this person to preside over the debate on his bill to block Joe Biden's forgiveness of student loan debt. He handed his gavel and said, you preside over the debate. The question is on passage of the joint resolution. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five minute vote. Yes, that is the putrid Marjorie Taylor Greene, who presided over the House on Wednesday as Congress debated student loan forgiveness. That's how serious Kevin McCarthy takes this debt ceiling crisis. He, he lets Marjorie Taylor Greene preside over the House. Mar well, Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's not the first time that she's been handed the gavel to preside over the House. It's part of the deal she struck earlier this year. The deal was, I'll support Kevin McCarthy in his bid to become speaker, and you give me the gavel, and I get to play speaker a couple of times. Now, before the vote was taken, and I'll give you the results of the vote in a second, but before they voted on whether or not to block Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness, Marjorie Taylor Greene was presiding over the debate on the bill. And Majority Leader Steve Scalise, Republican, got up and urged the Senate to pass the bill, as well as to pass Kevin McCarthy's debt ceiling bill. And some Democrats got a little vociferous. They murmured and uh, they made a little noise. And this did not sit well with the presiding officer, Marjorie Taylor Greene. The members are reminded to abide by decorum of the House. I hope I'm not the first one showing you this. I hope this is being played all over the world. The Democrats laughing at Marjorie Taylor Greene saying this. The members are reminded to abide by decorum of the House. <laughs> the insanity of giving the gavel to Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know... All she was asking is that members abide by the decorum of the House. And they laughed at her. What did Marjorie Taylor Greene ever do to earn the, the contempt of Democrats in the House, other than scream at Joe Biden during this year's State of the Union, calling him a liar? She called the head of Homeland Security a liar. She calls Ashley Babbitt a hero. She tries to secure the release from prison of the January 6th rioters who try to kill Nancy Pelosi. It's kind of ironic to hear one of the biggest supporters of January 6th trying to restore order in the House. She was giving tours the night before to people who ended up in jail after January 6th. Well, long story short, the House voted 218 to 203 to block Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness. And now the bill makes its way to the Senate, where thankfully it will die. But that's how serious Kevin McCarthy is about reigning in spending. This is what the Democrats are up against. Now, there is a solution to all this. It's called the 14th Amendment. I like to think that Joe Biden is leaving it off the table the same way you leave nuclear weapons off the table. But come June 1st, I, I don't know enough about this, but I, I listen to Bernie and I listen to progressives. If you invoke the 14th Amendment, it will put an end 
to these debt ceiling crises forever. These are artificial crises. I should mention that Democratic Congressman Jared Golden, who's been on this show, unfortunately, once again, this POS voted with Republicans. Jared Golden from Maine voted with Republicans to block the student loan relief. I mentioned Golden on the show yesterday when he joined Republicans in voting to reverse an EPA ruling that would impose stricter climate change regulations on automakers. That was an executive order, and because it requires two-thirds of both chambers to uh, overrule a presidential veto, Joe Biden's uh, executive order sticks until it's challenged in the Supreme Court. Well, Wednesday was Musk CTV, but it was on Twitter spaces, and nobody could see it because just like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's two terms as governor, it was a disaster. It was, you can watch it, you can see it. It Tech problems, it was just an F, a complete failure. But Florida Governor Ron DeSantis officially declared on Wednesday that he is a candidate for president. He did it on Twitter Spaces. Smart move. Right now, you, you get a glimpse into how a president is going to behave in the Oval Office by how he conducts his campaign and who he associates with in the lead up to the election. And we got a glimpse into the limited mind of Ron DeSantis tonight. He chose to align himself with Twitter and Elon Musk. Servers crashed, and at times you could barely hear Ron DeSantis speak, which is not necessarily a disaster. I think anytime you can't hear Ron DeSantis speak, it's like a day of sunshine. DeSantis said... He chose to make the announcement on Twitter because of Elon Musk, who owns Twitter. He said, I support Twitter and Elon Musk because Elon Musk is a champion of freedom of speech, and so am I. Ron DeSantis is a champion of freedom of speech. He hates the cancel culture. Huge champion of freedom of speech. Ron DeSantis, no governor has banned more books than Ron DeSantis. He demonizes our free press. He refuses to talk to reporters who he deems the enemy. He goes online and attacks reporters who he doesn't like. And he uses Twitter to attack these reporters and then invites intimidation and vitriol from his online Twitter followers. And even worse, Ron DeBacle is trying to pass a law in Florida that would make citizens subject to defamation lawsuits if they criticize elected officials. He wants to make it almost illegal to go on Facebook, Twitter, or do the thing I'm doing right now. He wants to make, it, make people like me subject to defamation if, just as a citizen, we criticize elected officials. This is Mr. Champion of free speech. Elon Musk and Ron DeSantis are not champions of free speech. They are champions of hate speech. They don't want a free and open press. They don't want to be criticized. What they want is to be able to accidentally slip the N-word and the C-word into their vocabulary and not get canceled for it. What they want is the freedom to say anything they want without marginalized communities rising up and calling them out for their racism and transphobia. We all know about Ron DeSantis's anti-trans bills. We all know what he's doing to the LGBTQ plus community. Elon Musk, his ally, has a transgender daughter who has stopped talking to him for one reason, his transphobia. 
So how bad, how bad are things getting in Florida? Well, Mr. Champion of Free Speech, Ron DeSantis, just banned her. The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. Mr. Freedom of Speech, the, 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 the champion of the First Amendment, Ron DeSantis, just banned Amanda Gorman. Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, which she read at President Biden's 2021 inauguration, has been banned from the Miami-Dade School District, which I think is the single largest school district in America. It has been banned. The, 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 the Hill We Climb, her poem, has been banned for uh, young readers. You have to be in middle school or above in order to read The Hill We, Cro uh, the Hill we Climb. Florida... Dade School District, Miami-Dade School District, has ruled, has banned this poem because it touches on critical race theory. And they've ruled that it's racist. Now, how did this happen? Well, thanks to laws passed by Mr. Free Speech, Ron DeSantis, parents in Florida can have more of a say in what their children are taught because that's the best way to educate kids, have Florida adults oversee the curriculum. Two students attending Bob Graham Education Center in Miami-Dade complained that Amanda Norman's poem, and I, am, I wish I was making this up, her poem contained hate speech targeting white people. A mother complained, and thanks to bills passed by racist Ron DeBacle, the poem has been moved off the shelves to guarantee that young readers wouldn't be exposed to lines like, quote, a skinny black girl descended from slaves who can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. That was deemed offensive to white people. And young people are, it's, it's been banned from elementary schools. Target said it is removing several products celebrating Gay Pride Month off its shelves at some stores, claiming the uproar is endangering the lives of some of the employees at Target. In an announcement on Tuesday, Target said, quote, since introducing this year's collection, we've experienced threats impacting our team members' sense of safety and well-being while at work. Several gay pride parades in Florida have been canceled thanks to the anti-trans bills of the Marquis DeSantis. This is fascism. This is this is jackbooted extrajudicial thugs going into Target, encouraged by people like Ron DeSantis. This is extrajudicial brown shirts and fascists going into places like Target and threatening marginalized communities. This is how fascism works. Parents getting books banned, uh, banning books that celebrate marginalized communities. This is how fascism works. This is exactly the playbook. Ron DeSantis, Ron DeBacle, the Marquis DeSantis, is a sadist. That's what, a, that's what fascism is. It, it appeals to everybody's sadistic streak. He can't do anything. We saw it on Wednesday night on Twitter when he aligned himself with the failure Elon Musk. Twitter is failing his his appearance on spaces or whatever Twitter spaces was a debacle. He can't do anything 
other than destroy people's lives. As I'll keep reminding you until Donald Trump, bless his soul, destroys, destroys Ron DeSantis, sends him to the same dust heap of history that Jeb Bush and that family of grifters resides in right now, thanks to Donald Trump. Until Ron DeSantis is humiliated by Donald Trump, I'm going to keep reminding you that Ron DeSantis is a failure. He's accomplished nothing. Absolutely nothing. Even his military record is, is, is a failure. He was, first of all, he wore the uniform. He was a JAG officer. So he never, the only action he saw was at Gitmo watching the inmates get tortured. That's the only action Ron DeSantis, he's a lawyer who suited up for his resume. Ron DeSantis, by every measure, is a failure. Florida is the 46th most underinsured state in America. It is the single most expensive place to live. Wages are stagnating there. Medical care is a disaster. I, sh I, I pointed this out yesterday. The AARP says Florida ranks dead last in quality health care for senior citizens. That's Florida's job to take care of our grandparents. Anybody who retires to Florida is out of their effing mind. The AARP says Ron DeSantis' Florida ranks dead last in quality health care for senior citizens. It is second in the nation for most drug overdoses. It has the single highest high school dropout rates. They're so busy banning books. Their kids can't even graduate college. You can't get an abortion. But everybody can carry a gun. It has one of the highest infant mortality rates in America. And as I said yesterday, as I said yesterday, Mr. Fascist Ron DeSantis, Mr. Jackbooted Thug, who's so strong on law and order, right? The one thing about fascists is they're supposed to make us feel safe, right? Well, it turns out Florida under Ron DeSantis is the seventh most dangerous state in America. He is a failure as a human being and as a governor. And the only thing he can do because he can't build anything, the only thing he can do is destroy people's lives. That's what Ron DeSantis can do. He can drive the LGBTQ community underground, be fearful, get beaten up in restrooms, and commit suicide. That's the only thing Ron DeSantis can do. He is a failure at everything. All he can do is make African-Americans feel further marginalized and frightened and unable to vote. He is a failure. Now, I do not like Donald Trump, and I, I do not wish him well, but I will be watching in glee as he destroys Ron DeSantis because... Donald Trump is a bully. Ron DeSantis is a bully. And there is nothing more satisfying than watching a bigger bully mop the floor with a weaker bully like Ron DeBacle. I think that's it. You got to fight. You got to fight. You got to fight these people. I want Medicare for all. I want to tax billionaires out of existence. I, I believe in class struggle. And one of the ways they keep that from us is by going after the marginalized, by going after black people, Mexicans, migrants, and the LGBTQ community. We have to fight these people. They're evil. Ask the difficult questions. Ask Ron DeSantis, are Jews and Muslims... And members of the LGBTQ community are going to go to heaven. Ask the tough questions that they don't want to answer.
It's time now for the Hirschenfelds. Dr. Philip Hirschenfeld is a Freudian psychoanalyst, and comedian Ethan Hirschenfeld is the author of Today Is Now. And I have some questions that, I, uh, that I've been thinking about. I've been going for long walks. I want to ask you about baby health, baby mental health, because here on the show, you've been teaching us that most of our problems stem from how we were traumatized as babies. And there are various phases that we go through, oral, anal. And so can a baby, can a toddler going through those phases, phases have some type of mental health problems? And then... Who do you blame? I mean, if you haven't gone through your oral phase, well, I guess you'd go through the oral phase the first year. But can a baby have mental health issues? One sign, if your baby, if you noticed your baby smoking more than one pack of cigarettes a day, <laughs> that baby is probably experiencing anxiety and it's probably in the workplace because they don't have a lot of stress at home. So they're probably experiencing work at home. And so you're going to want to look into that. Um, and just, you're going to want to switch them. You don't cold Turkey is a very bad idea for a baby. <laughs> you want to just wean them up, go to the Virginia slim, go to the uh, sort of thin feminine cigarette for a while and wean, wean them off of it. That's why they call it weaning. So what are Doctor. the what, what are the phases that a a child goes through before they're considered developed? So basically, there's the training bra, <laughs> which I had and to then, wear. Why did I have to wear it? That's between you and your God. <laughs> and then after that, you're basically developed. And then you really should wear a bra beyond <laughs> that for all sorts of reasons. I've noticed lately, especially here in Williamsburg, I feel like the bra has gone the way of, of like the 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 uh, I don't know the the manual blender. People just aren't using bras the way they used to. It you, seems to have become an optional thing. Is that a good I thing don't know or a bad? That thing. Happened. Is that good or bad? It's like the sixties. I don't think it's a good thing. I think it has a. It serves an actual function, both for the person who wears it, and for all of the people that they're walking by. Right. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, you know in in uh, in German the the bra is called the Brusthalter, which just means a breast holder. They have very <laughs> like. Very, very literal words for things. And, and a BMW, like, um, I, I think a Mercedes and a BMW come, it's not optional, come with breast holders. With the, yeah, so it, the, the, for short in German, the Brusthalter is a BH. So like B&H photo, when mm -hmm. it says BH on those bags. That's what that, so the Brusthalter, it's a very important thing. Some, something needs to hold the breasts. And what better <laughs> item than a, than a bra? Um, that's what I'm, that's really what I'm advocating for here. But where were the question I have real Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, I have met some one year olds and I've thought to myself, this kid needs to go, uh, needs to go on the couch. This kid needs psychiatric one years old. There's just something, something isn't right. C can mental illness pop up? at one or two, in all seriousness? There, first of all, if you've been getting from me that there's always somebody to blame, I want to correct that misperception. It's not about blaming anybody. People are born differently with different capacities, different... Um, sensitivities to anxiety or to environment. And sometimes it's just a mismatch between the environment and what the baby but, comes with. I told you that story about the two mothers who were interviewed about eating. 
And one mother said, every meal is fighting and screaming and crying, and it's a horror show. All this kid will eat is ketchup. The other mother said, eating? No problem at all. I just pour ketchup over everything, and he gobbles it up. So we're all, there are no perfect human beings. Some people have a heightened sensitivity to anxiety from birth. Depends how that's handled by a particular mother. Some mothers will be able to deal with it. Others won't. It will, in that case, get worse. Um, And when does development end? Never. Development is a lifelong process. These different stages are, you know, they're, they're convenient to be able to think about stages of development. But, but we all have, I mean, what about somebody who's, who's 30 years old and can't stop smoking or drinking or eating? They've got an oral issue that they've never solved. But that is some kind of trauma. Am I pronouncing that properly? Is some kind of trauma stemming from the breastfeeding period, right? Maybe. Maybe it's not a trauma. Maybe this particular kid just had a um, an insatiable appetite for one reason or another. Okay. What I, fa- I, I'll talk about me. I apparently would not eat for my first five years. And in a Jewish family with close roots to Europe, this was a tragedy and a crisis. And I think the accurate story is I got my tonsils out at about four or five, which is a trauma for any kid. Still remember the ether mask being put over my face. And once my tonsils came out, and it was painful as hell, and I had to eat ice cream, I never stopped eating after that. I just ate and ate. I was a fat kid. Um, So is there anybody to blame for that? I, I don't think so. Could it have been handled better in one way or another? Probably. Could there have been some problem. kind of trauma? You just said getting the tonsils removed was traumatic. Could that have yeah. been the trauma that sparked the the eating? It could have. So I think we're getting someplace here. <laughs> I want to say I also had the ether mask put on. That was that happened. At least once a week at the Hebrew Day School, you said. <laughs> well, and I, wa- I think those rabbis have recently been brought up on charges. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about uh, ultra religious people like the Orthodox Jews and the ultra Orthodox Christians, specifically down in Florida. Governor DeSantis signed a raft of bills uh, this week. Uh, saying schools are forbidden from uh, identifying and honoring your preferred pronoun, but most importantly, the bathroom. You, you, you in Florida, if you do not use the bathroom you were assigned to at birth, you get bathroom assignments now in Florida. If you don't use the bathroom that you're supposed to use, you will be arrested and charged with trespassing. So there, there is a loophole in Florida. You're always allowed to crap on the law. <laughs> the weather's this, nice. This is an example of a whole state and its leader being fixated in the anal stage, obviously. So what is this? So what is this about? This fear of. Control. It's about control. And bath. Control other people. Yes. And so bathrooms, anal phase, control. What? What? Psychologically. Yes. What is All this? Of that. Yes. 
But it's not about religion. It's about politics and control. And it's a cynical use of religion. Do you think DeSantis cares about any of this? Nope. What is the legitimate argument that could be made for restricting bathrooms? It, it, there is none. Uh, it's, it's very simple. It's a very simple argument. It can be very frightening at any age to see a pee-pee. Mm -hmm. It can be a terrifying thing to see. For any age, any gender, it's, it's, a, it's just a scary appendage in a lot of ways. Right. So what they're worried about, I think, is their virginal Floridian maidens going to the bathroom and suddenly there's a ding dong. And that's terrifying. Right. So they're but they, but this is what I don't get about the whole debate. I mean, there are many things, but presumably if we're talking about the girls bathroom, there's no like public display of genitalia. There's no like ding dong waving section. The girls bathroom is all behind stalls. I could see if it was the boys bathroom there, there's some potential ding dong visibility but when you're in the girls room when is this supposed uh revelation of the phallus ha even happening okay what so are, this is so what are they worried about okay so this is i'm glad you, you brought that up in all seriousness if a a patient comes to you and says i'm 40 years old I've had this memory that when I was a young girl, I was using a public restroom and a, a woman showed me her. I'm being absolutely serious here. A woman showed me her penis. <laughs> Wait, again, but I'm asking you, where in the bathroom was this happen? Exactly. In a stall, by the sink, by the... By the dryer, you know, those dryers with those extremely high volumes of air that shoot out now. Right. What is when is all of this? Where is this happening in their imaginations? In the mad yeah, end, DeSantis is his imagination. That's where it happened. Well, well, that's the thing, because it could it's as likely to happen by the bleachers on the ball field as it is in the in the girls. room. There's just no place where people are disrobing. Okay. I, I don't know what. Anyway, well, what but, about. Yeah. OK, so what about a locker room? What about if it, what about if a, a a 40 year old woman comes to you and says, when I was 12, I was changing in the locker at the gym and a woman disrobed and I saw a penis. Is is that a trauma? Should it be a trauma? What is could, could it should be or shouldn't be right? Probably will be to certain people. It probably won't be to other people. Other people will just laugh at it. Mm -hmm. But because of the different psychologies of people. So how would you treat? I'm, I, I'm being this is because this is a serious. We make jokes, but I'm actually genuinely concerned here. I would assume that the proper psychiatric advice is why did that bother you what why is it what what is it was something that you didn't understand but it was just something you saw that you should understand that this is the way this person was born and they weren't hurting you i mean if somebody claims to have been traumatized yeah, yeah. It, I would take it at face value. They're still remembering it. So in some way or another, it was a trauma. But I would not, their parent or their pastor could explain the thing that you just explained. Well, this was the way they were born and blah, blah, blah. But from my perspective, that I'm not interested in the external. I'm interested in what it meant to this person who still 30 years later is thinking about it. And what I would say, since this is a hypothetical person, so we, we, we can theorize without any real data, 
I would say that it stimulated some hidden desires in this person, this little kid, that they were not at all comfortable with. I'm just remembering. So What's that? I'm just remembering a memory. Okay, this therapy is finally working. So we used to go to Cleveland on Route 80 to visit my grandparents. And we were driving home from Cleveland. And back then, it was like a 12-hour drive. And we stopped in a New Jersey restroom. And my father uh, <laughs> opened up. We, we had to go pee. And he, uh, the urinals were all taken. So my father opens up a bathroom stall. And I hear, ooh. And <laughs> he says, don't go in there. And I'm like eight. And he goes into the next stall to pee. And I go, don't go in there. <laughs> don't open this door. <laughs> and once my father said, don't open this door. You had to open it. I had to open it. And it was traumatizing what I saw that needed to be cleaned. <laughs> and I'm thinking of all the, tra there are traumas. And I would have preferred to have seen a man's penis to, to what I saw in there. Right. <laughs> but I just got <laughs> do you father, remember which rest stop that was on Route 80? Because it's it, it was, a was the Florence it, still hasn't been taken care of. it was the Florence Nightingale rest stop. Okay. Uh Governor DeSantis signed the the bill forbidding people from using the the bathrooms they weren't assigned to at birth. And he said, Florida is a citadel of normalcy. Mm. Let kids be kids. And Florida will be remembered as a citadel of normalcy. Mm -hmm. What does normalcy mean? Is, is there such thing? Oh, I was going to say, what is a citadel? <laughs> a citadel is like a fortress, I think. Which I, suggests that. They're being attacked. Isn't a citadel a fortress or something? Sure I is. think so. I, I, I didn't. Was it Harding who campaigned on a return to normalcy? Like after World War One, he promised he would restore normalcy. And then I think he died in bed with a prostitute. Uh, That's normal for sure. The, yeah. Republican. So what is what is normalcy? What is normal? And what does that mean? What is the message you're sending to kids when you say we we need to return to normalcy? What is the message? Well, maybe it's that we should go back to the 50s. And everybody was bored out of their minds. So we then had the 60s and 70s. These things do have a certain cyclic pa cyclical pattern. Does normal exist? Well, on the on, oh, I, I was just going to say uh, on the macro level, what you're describing, doctor. Yes, but on the micro level, there were just much more. I think there was just a lot more suffering in silence of kids who were in the closet and kids who had some doubts or anxieties or serious issues around their sexuality so the 50s nightmare 60s nightmare so they want to return they want to return the world to that situation there's just thousands tens or hundreds of thousands of people suffering in silence isn't it no, a is there normal everybody was because there was this code of silence ozzy and harriet had twin beds with a night table between them lest anybody suspect that well, they and, might end up. and Ozzy was a bedwetter. It was, there were other issues besides. Is there such a thing as normal? And isn't that fascist dog whistle? Isn't that something Hitler would say that you have to be that we define what since normal is a construct? Of course. Yeah. So it's saying That's exactly right. You have to be like this. Otherwise, go commit suicide. 
That's the message. Yeah, that- no, obviously, for him, normal is Christian, normal is white, normal is heterosexual, normal is all sorts of, all sorts of things that are what he is and uh, his voters predominantly. So, yes, it's fascist. It's anti-democratic. It's uh, it's boring. It's dangerous. It's anachronistic. And, uh, you know, screw them. Have we got- it's what they all are on the surface. They have got just as many perversions and anxieties and conflicts because that is what is normal. What is the definition of a perversion? Does it change with time? Is it the DSM? Is that what it's called? Yeah, That's, uh, the DMV is right. You, where you have to register your perversion and get a permit. Yeah, a perversion a perversion is like basically the simple definition for the layperson is is any sexual activity that <laughs> I'm interested in that you that that you that's not the end of it David. <laughs> any sexual activity that I'm interested in that you're willing to pay to watch me engage in <laughs> that's a perversion. It needs to meet both of those criteria. I you have thought, to be willing yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought I, I thought you were going to say a perversion is something that I want but you don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, you know. Well, yeah, that's another. In the yeah. afternoon? What are you sick? Yeah. Uh, you're perver- yeah. uh, I, I would assume I would assume the definition of a perversion has altered over the years. Right. I, it's, I think actually <laughs> the the critical criterion in diagnosing a perversion is how the person experiencing those feelings relates to the feelings. So, for example, if I like to, you know, put on uh, combat boots and a bustier and stand at my window with my binoculars. Um, by the way, I have the binoculars right here. Um, <laughs> this is all hypothetical. And if d- doing those things and then watching just taxi cabs, just yellow cabs. Right. When I watch them through my binoculars, that just fills me with erotic satisfaction. If I feel okay with that, and if I have the consent of the Taxi and Limousine Commission, <laughs> then that's not a perversion, even though from the outside it looks pretty perverse. Right. So it's it's about it's about is am I right? I'm. Uh, what do you say, doctor? Well, you are wearing a yellow T-shirt. <laughs> yes. So I don't think this is a coincidence. There are no coincidences. So if you're, yeah, if you, because as we all know, I think was it up until 1971, psychiatry listed homosexuality as a perversion. Right. Yeah. You know. T- as Madonna said in her seminal 1994 book, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was there was a lot of nudity in it. Um, <laughs> pe- people asked her about uh, kind of S and M and those kind of activities, and she said, "Look, as long as nobody gets hurt." Now, I would take that a step further and say, even if somebody does get hurt, that's also fun. I mean, what you know, what's a little pain? You know, as long as everyone's consented, that is. Right. So, yeah. So pain is is really, uh, pain is fine. Um, as long as you're, as long as you're having fun. Here's another question I have. There are 8 billion people on the planet, which means there are four, little under 4 billion men, right? There are more women than men. Yes. Is it? Fair to assume that of the four billion, and I'm being serious, that of four billion men, you know, you read about this sexual assault case against Rudy Giuliani, who 
The woman alleges that Rudy Giuliani made her perform oral sex while he talked to Donald Trump. Now, I'm thinking what I'm not passing judgment, but I'm you thinking shouldn't. I shouldn't. Sure. Yes. Well, I should pass judgment. Yes. I, I'm just thinking, how do you maintain your tumescence while you hear the voice of Donald Trump? Because he's excited by Donald Trump. That's why he's got a hard on to begin with. Oh boy! This wow! Is really that so, is but upsetting. is that what's going? It's all this, this woman is just a substitute in his mind for Donald. So, a, a homophobic Rudy Giuliani. Actually, yeah. he's not. He beca- he actually lived with a gay couple between divorces. He wasn't homophobic. He became that way too, for political reasons. When he was mayor of New York, he was. Pretty accepting, I guess. But is is this homoerotic? Is he turned on sexually by Donald Trump's voice or the pat? What is going on? Yeah, I, that, that's my assumption. His submission to Donald consistently was an erotic submission. Somewhere in his mind. And it's actually in both of their minds. So rape in can involve ejaculation, not necessarily. But if it yeah. does involve ejaculation, it's power. It's the it's your sexual appetite being satiated through power. Is through power. And through sadism, yeah. Wow. Wow. So America's the- mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's. Yeah. So it, it's Sad. it, and it's not sex, because sex implies an act of. Love. This is even though there is ejaculation or an erection involved, this is power. Pure and yeah, simple. And power and hatred. Yes. And dominance over another human being. Correct. Taking and and all. Careful, and also, careful, <laughs> careful. <laughs> I know that I know your face now. <laughs> I know you have something <laughs> funny to say. No, I was going to say there's one other element to Rudy, which is that for him, it's in that moment, it's all about billable hours. So he's also the whole thing for him, the added the value added, it's all on the clock. So he, the whole time he's thinking about, oh, and I can bill for this. So it's uh, it's a bonanza. You're right. It's the whole thing. I mean, the man, Rudy Giuliani, how does... Well, he's a drunk, hands hands down. Well, that's the other thing. I heard someone interviewed on Democracy Now! today saying that the meeting, it was that whistleblower from the CIA who who was the one who reported that the pardons were, were for sale for $2 million, which the president was going to split with, with Giuliani, allegedly. <laughs> but he said that the meeting was called for 2 p.m. and someone said, you got to do it before noon because by 2, Rudy is is too drunk to function. Right. So that he really, so he was, he's a serious alcoholic, which is a disease. Let's remember that. And let's have empathy for people who suffer with that terrible disease of addiction, addiction of any kind, addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs, addiction to having your employees blow you constantly from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. These are all addictions and they can all be crippling. So let me go. We have to wrap it up. I want to ask you what you're reading. Uh, But I want to go back to the question about four billion men. If the three of us, I always think of this as a car ride. We're heading somewhere, right? And we're I'm, I'm driving 
Ethan's in the back seat. Dr. Hershenfeld is holding court in the passenger seat. And I say there are four billion <laughs> men on this planet. Look around. What is there a man who would see that and get an erection of the four billion? Well, this is fun. it's very interesting that you say that because this is something that the doctor, the doctor said said once, which is actually quoted not infrequently by uh, by a very good friend of mine, who the doctor, whom the doctor also knows well, and this has come up many times, and he has said to me, as your father once said. If you can imagine it, <laughs> there's somebody who has that fantasy. He actually addressed this exact question. If you can imagine, yes, if you can imagine that perversion or whatever, there's someone out there. That's what they're into. We should do a podcast of the three of us driving through the Bronx. Oh, and, I, and I'll point that garbage can over there with the Chick-fil-A wrapper and the way the mustard is sitting on the ketchup and a fly on top, that specific moment of a fly on top of a Chick-fil-A wrapper with mustard and ketchup, is there a man on this planet who would get, <laughs> get an erection from that? <laughs> is there? I'm worried about you, David. <laughs> this Listen. This Band-Aid, no, this Band-Aid, this bloody Band-Aid on the curb that's been left here. Ethan, <laughs> Ethan, Ethan does not know this little vignette yet, but uh, my um, life partner. Your what? A bad, my life partner. Jesus. <laughs> she has a bad back. And she goes to a very highly respected um, chiropractor with a very nice setup. <clears throat> and he's been helping her, and she was working with one of his underlings today, and they were chatting. And the guy said what he does in his spare time is he tries to do stand-up because he was always very frightened of speaking in public. And now he's doing stand-up, and, and he really likes it a lot. And she said, do you know Ethan Hershenfeld? And he said, do I? I've seen his comedy special. Wow. He is terrific. Wow. Uh, thug, so thug, you're, Jew. You're inspiring a, a, another generation. It's amazing. Well, let me before I, I, uh, I want to meet this person. Before you go, what would Freud say about a a chiropractor who wants to do stand up? What 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 is going on there? Is he right standing up straight? I mean, there's something. Okay. Uh, I guess it's a lot harder to be a psychiatrist than I thought. Well, a Freudian. Yeah, I discovered that also. I mean, I, I could write that also. I could write prescriptions. I don't. I couldn't do what Doctor Real Doctor Hershenfeld does because I could write prescriptions. I have bad handwriting. Well, uh, let's what, be honest. It's a, it's it's not easy, <laughs> and it's and the doctor has been at it for a long time with a lot of success. So we got to give him his props. Yeah, we joke, we kid, but he's been doing this noble work. He's smirking because he doesn't feel comfortable with praise. Right. But he's a, he's a real professional. He's devoted to it. And we can only hope that that more people are blessed with finding a career that they really like so much that they want to do it for their whole lives. So he has had that. That's great. That's a great blessing. Right. Um, so, absolutely is. Right. What, do you, what are you reading? What are you reading? Both I'm not reading. I've given it up. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hershenfeld, you were reading lecture notes and books that would not interest us. I started a new book this week, but I can't remember the name of it. So I can't. I'll tell you what I'm also reading. I'm reading this scene. I'm auditioning tomorrow. Look at the name of the character I'm auditioning for. 
Wow. Phil. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, I'm playing. I'm Phil. And the scene, it, it's in a, the scene, it's a show called um, Eugene the Marine. It's a movie. It was going to be starring Nick Nolte when I looked it up. But now it's starring that guy, Scott Glenn. You know that actor? F- Scott yeah, Glenn, he was, who was in Silence of the Lambs. He was right. in the right stuff, of, yeah. but he didn't play John Glenn. Exactly. But he didn't play John exactly. Glenn. That's right. correct. So the scene, I, that's so anyway, Phil, that's what I'm reading. A scene with Phil. All right. I got to show you guys something. I'm going to see Ethan this weekend in New Orleans. Which you've been completely, you can't get your story straight. You say you're visiting doc, Dr. Phil says he's visiting his grandson, but Ethan says he's visiting his nephew. This yeah. Is, and I'm I'm bringing this book, Ethan, as a gift. Oh to yes, you, you Thank know you. it. Yes, Carrie oh, you know Carrie Grant's suit. Nine movies that made me the wreck. Yeah, you I gave am it today. to me already. I have it by oh. my bed, and oh, I like okay. it. Thank so you. I'll, I'll keep this copy. But give Thank it to you. me again. Why is okay. that book? What, what's so great about the book? It's a good book about the movie industry. Oh, okay. It's about movies. It discusses about nine different. Seminal, may, may I use that word in this program? Yes, yes. Seminal yes. films. Mm, okay. Thank you both, Dr. Philip. All right. Thank you. God bless. Okay. God, God bless. bless. Okay, and if you God decide bless. to cancel, let me know. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump.